Hello, my name is Wesley Buckwalter, a philosophy student at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And together with Mark Phelan of Lawrence University, we'd like to present our paper, Does the SNM Robot Feel Guilty? One more robot learns to The SNM robot is an entity that appears in the vignettes used in experiments conducted by Justin Sitzma and Edward Mashery, presented in their 2010 Philosophical Studies paper, Two Conceptions of Subjective Experience. In our presentation, we'll give some new results which respond directly to the data provided by SNM. But please visit Justin's website for more information about their prior work, or also see Justin's presentation at the Online Consciousness Conference 2009. But before we begin, we'd like to take this opportunity to thank first Professor David Rosenthal for inspiring this work at the Merge Conference on Experimental Philosophy of Consciousness, to Justin Sitzma for his comments on this presentation at this year's Online Consciousness Conference, and lastly to Richard Brown for organizing the fourth annual Online Consciousness Conference. So let's begin with what we're calling the manifest dichotomy view. It's the majority view or the default view or the view I've wagered you'd come across if you've opened a single textbook in the philosophy of mind, and that's that typically philosophers of mind distinguish between two different sorts of mental states. On the one hand, certain states involve seeing red, feeling pain, or feeling angry, and on the other hand, certain states involve things like believing, desiring, hoping, or making judgments. And philosophers of mind with views as diverse as John Searle, Dave Chalmers, or Ned Block, all defend this dichotomy on the grounds that members of the first set of states, states like seeing red or feeling pain, each have this manifest and unavoidable phenomenal character the second set of states, states like believing or desiring, just seem to lack. And accordingly, these philosophers maintain that we should group the first set of states together because they just obviously share this property that there's something it's like to occupy them. And conversely, they maintain we should distinguish these states from the second set of states because those states lack this feeling or quality. And of course, the result is that states like seeing red or feeling pain are referred to as experiential states or subjective experiences, and states like belief and desire are referred to as intentional states. But suppose for a moment that you've never picked up a single textbook in the philosophy of mind. That's okay, because many philosophers discuss phenomenal consciousness as if it were a perfectly ordinary or folk notion. So here's what Professor Dennett has to say. He says, the concept of phenomenal consciousness is just part of the lure of our folk theory of consciousness. It's something that we pick up in the course of our enculturation. Ned Block often equates the philosophical conception of subjective experience with the common sense conception. In Churchland and Goldman, there's reference to the folk notion of consciousness or the folk psychological notion of phenomenal consciousness. And Dave Chalmers goes as far as to say that phenomenal consciousness is actually part of the most familiar and manifest aspect of our mental lives. But given that this distinction is taken to be a perfectly ordinary or folk notion, the manifest dichotomy of view may entail a series of tacit empirical commitments about how people think about the difference between intentional and phenomenal states. And so what we'd like to do in this talk is first present some of the work experimental philosophers have been doing looking at ordinary categorization schemas that people actually seem to be using. Then, we'll review the empirical challenge as an m suggesting that people do not actually group mental states in the way these philosophers have assumed. Next, we'll present our own experiments in direct response to s and studies, specifically suggesting that assumptions about an entity's function may play an important role in how we ascribe mental states. And then lastly, we'll briefly discuss a few ways these new results about an entity's function might be relevant to future discussions about phenomenal consciousness. If experiential states really are fundamentally different from intentional states because of their obvious and unmistakable phenomenal character, then presumably non-philosophers will be prone to sort mental states in a similar way as philosophers. 
Specifically, we might predict that ordinary people will categorize states like seeing red, feeling pain, and feeling angry together, despite their differences, because it is like something to occupy those experiential states. And we might predict that they will distinguish those experiential states from intentional mental states of believing or desiring, because it is not like anything to occupy those intentional states. But do non-philosophers group the diverse states that make up the philosopher's class of subjective experiences together? And do they distinguish these from intentional states? Recently, cognitive scientists, including experimental philosophers and psychologists, have begun to explore these questions by empirically investigating how people ordinarily conceive of subjective experience. These researchers, like many philosophers of mind before them, study this topic by considering what mental states we would ordinarily attribute to other non-human entities. But instead of speculating on this by way of a thought experiment, they actually assess the responses of ordinary people by means of controlled experiments. This method assumes that attributions of mental states reflect the categorization schema for mental states that people tacitly accept. In particular, if ordinary people categorize a mental state as an experience insofar as it possesses an unavoidable phenomenal character, then we should expect this to be reflected in their attributions of phenomenal states to other entities. Building on the assumption that the intuitive schema for mental states is reflected in ordinary attributions, three positions on the folk category of subjective experience have recently been advocated in the prevailing empirical literature. The first position holds that ordinary people group experiential states together and distinguish them from intentional states in roughly the same way that philosophers traditionally have. According to another position, people downplay the distinction between experiential and intentional states in important ways. Lastly, the third view holds that people do not ordinarily group experiential states together in the way that philosophers have suggested. Here we challenge a prominent statement of the third position. According to Justin Sitzma and Edouard Machery, people ordinarily distinguish subjective experiences that have a valence, or a hedonic value for the subject, from those that lack a valence. Sitzma and Machery argue that this valenced folk concept of subjective experience could raise problems for a philosophical tradition that emphasizes the manifest phenomenal nature of subjective experience. Consider the totality of mental states. Philosophers identify one set of mental states as subjective experiences, and they supposedly do so because those states all have a manifest phenomenal character. Ordinary people identify a different set of mental states as subjective experiences, apparently on the basis of whether those states are valenced, seeming to pay no heed to the supposedly manifest and obvious fact of phenomenal character. Thus, we may have good reason to doubt whether explaining the philosopher's phenomenal qualities constitutes a major problem for the philosophy of mind, much less the hard problem of phenomenal consciousness. Let's investigate a bit more closely how Sitzma and Machery attempt to establish experimentally that philosophers and ordinary people have different concepts of subjective experience. Sitzma and Machery's method rests on the assumption that neither philosophers nor the folk will attribute subjective experiences to simple robots, an assumption that, as Sitzma and Machery point out, has been made by a number of prominent philosophers of mind. With this assumption in place, and assuming that subjective experiences and intentional states are mutually exclusive categories of mental states, Sitzma and Machery can chart the contours of the philosophical and folk concepts of subjective experience by investigating what mental states each group will attribute to a simple robot, Jimmy. Over the course of several experiments, Jimmy sorts boxes based on color and smell, receives a high-volt shock, and meets with a violent competitor bot. Depending on which condition participants were assigned to, they are asked whether Jimmy sees red, smells bananas, feels pain, or feels anger. Sitzma and Machery present philosophers and ordinary people with either a case in which Jimmy receives a shock 
and recoils in roughly the same way a biological organism might. Or with a case in which Jimmy successfully completes an assigned task involving identification of a red box based on its color. Presented with these cases, ordinary people are willing to attribute seeing red to the robot, but not feeling pain. Professional philosophers, on the other hand, attribute mental states in a way consonant with philosophical tradition by denying Jimmy both of these experiential states. This result suggests that people do not ordinarily group states of sub subjective experience together in the same way as philosophers do. On the basis of their first study, S&M tentatively conclude that philosophers and non-philosophers have different concepts of subjective experience. The philosophical concept presumably relies heavily on the philosopher's notion of phenomenal consciousness. But to determine what underlies the folk concept, S&M go on to conduct several other studies focusing only on folk attributions across different sense modalities and for different kinds of experiential states. Surveying the results of these studies, S&M discovered that participants are sometimes willing to ascribe subjective experiences to a robot, but that these descriptions vary both within and across sense modalities, including the sense modality of feeling, seeing, and smelling. Sitzma and Mashari explain this pattern of responses by reference to the valence of the particular states under consideration. In one study, for instance, Sitzma and Mashari ask ordinary participants to assess cases in which the robot is presented with the smell of bananas on the one hand and vomit on the other, smells that participants are likely to find pleasant or unpleasant. In yet another condition in this study, participants are asked to assess a case in which the robot is presented with the smell of isomyl acetate, a smell with which participants are likely unfamiliar and which therefore lacks, for ordinary participants, either a positive or negative valence. Sitzma and Mashari found that people were willing to say that the robot could smell the valence-neutral chemical, but were ambivalent about whether the robot could smell bananas and vomit. Thus, it seems that people were not considering whether smell is a state that has a phenomenal character when deciding to attribute that experiential state to the S&M robot. Instead, they seem to have based their attributions on the particular valence of the smell in question. Together with the previous results for seeing red and feeling pain, these results for smell provide evidence to support S&M's positive claim regarding the factors that guide folk attributions of subjective experience. Sitzma and Mashari conclude that, in contrast to philosophers' emphasis on the phenomenology of subjective mental states, for the folk, subjective states seem to be primarily states with a valence. Their hypothesis is that people do not distinguish subjective experiences by their common possession of a manifest phenomenal character, but rather in virtue of judgments concerning an experience's valence. However, is this really the best explanation for Sitzma and Mashari's pattern of results? In the remainder of this paper, we want to explore the possibility that the attributions of mental states to the S&M robot in Sitzma and Mashari's studies and beyond may be due not to assumptions about the states under consideration, but to assumptions about the function for which the robot was designed. S&M contend that people are willing to attribute some experiential states to the S&M robot because from their perspective those states are non-valenced, but they're unwilling to attribute valence states. But what we want to ask is, is this really the best explanation of S&M's pattern of results? What we want to suggest instead is that these results could be due to tacit assumptions on the part of experimental participants about the function to which the S&M robot was created. So for instance, in S&M's vignettes, function is just left unspecified. Thus, participants are left to draw their own conclusions about the function of the robot, and this could play an important role in explaining the asymmetry between different experiential states. Consider, for instance, the results of the olfactory study. While participants may be unlikely to suppose that a robot would, be, would have been designed with the function of detecting bananas or vomit, it's easy to imagine why one would invent a robot to detect a technical sounding chemical. And so maybe people's assumptions about likely functions 
are guiding their assessments of mental state attribution. And so it's possible that people's intuitions aren't guided by things about the state, but rather things about the entity to which those states are ascribed. And so our hypothesis was that SNM results can be explained in terms of the function of the SNM robot relative to the particular state in question. To get at whether experiential state attributions to a robot really are guided by assessments of the robot's function, we designed a study in which we specified functions for the robot that would require it to either smell bananas or vomit. The robot in our vignettes was given either the function of making smoothies or cleaning up biomedical waste. Of course, specifying a robot's function might also inadvertently increase people's assumptions about the robot's level of general complexity. So we designed our study to manipulate the robot's complexity independently of its function. Finally, we asked participants about each of the olfactory objects that the robot interacted with, either a box that smelled like isomal acetate, bananas, or vomit. The result was a two by two by three experiment that independently manipulated the complexity of the robot, the robot's function, and the objects with which the robot interacts. In our study, the description of how the robot actually manipulated the olfactory objects was identical to S&M's. So our study only differed in adding the extra information about function and complexity. In this Between Subjects online experiment, 253 participants were randomly assigned to one of 12 possible conditions. Here's how these cases worked. First, people were introduced to Jimmy with one of two stories that manipulated Jimmy's general complexity. Jimmy could be either one, a relatively simple robot built at a state university, or two, a relatively complicated robot built at an Ivy League university. Next, the vignettes proceeded by manipulating the robot's function. So one group of participants saw a vignette that continued, he was created in order to clean up biomedical waste, while another group of participants saw that he was created in order to make fruit smoothies. Lastly, participants saw the vignettes continue involving one of three possible sets of objects involving either the banana, the chemical, or vomit. Then we asked participants the same two questions. First, to gauge their phenomenal state attributions, we asked, did Jimmy smell the object in question, either bananas, isomal acetate, or vomit? And then secondly, to gauge their affective ratings of these smells, we asked, what kind of smell do you consider those smells to be? What we found was that the main result of our study was that phenomenal attribution ratings to the SNM robot regarding the different kinds of objects in the vignettes depended on the robot's function. When the robot was designed to make fruit smoothies, people were much more likely to say that he smelled the chemical in the banana, but not the vomit. And then conversely, when his function was to clean up biomedical waste, mean scores were higher for the vomit than for the chemical, and to a lesser extent the banana, despite the level of complexity we specified. Thus, functions seem to be an important characteristic that people considered when ascribing phenomenal states to Jimmy, independently of the level of complexity of the robot. But even if function is key for folk attributions of experiential states, valence could still be playing an important role in its own right. To find out, we took the smell preference rating we had previously collected from participants regarding the different smells of the objects they were presented with, and then coded those scores to create an affect measure, where higher numbers meant a greater degree of perceived valence of either positive or negative degree. Unsurprisingly, there were large significant differences between the affective scores people generated when they were, when they were presented with the chemical, the banana, or the vomit. However, no relationship was found between the affective score and the smell attribution ratings people gave. Thus, it seems as though the key piece of evidence for the SNM valence hypothesis is actually better explained in terms of the differing beliefs about the subject of the experience, in this case the assumptions about the robot's function, rather than the assumptions about the valence of the experience itself.
So far, we've seen some evidence for the claim that attributions of experiential states like smell could depend on the robot's function and not judgments regarding smell valence. However, since S&M report findings across modalities, we'd also like to know if the assumptions people were making about function might also explain their reticence to attribute subjective experiences like felt emotions to the robot. So in our second experiment, we used Jimmy the robot to investigate people's attributions of felt emotions like guilt. In a two by two between subjects experiment, 118 participants again saw one of four possible conditions about the S&M robot. Here's how the vignettes worked in experiment two. First, general complexity was manipulated by presenting participants with the non-complex or complex versions of Jimmy from experiment one. Next, the function was manipulated as follows. Half of the participants were told that Jimmy was designed to be a friend of the elderly by interpreting and responding to their emotional needs, while the other half of participants was told that Jimmy was made to be a tool for the elderly by lifting and moving heavy objects around their houses. Lastly, all of the vignettes concluded as follows. After reading these vignettes, all the participants were asked the same two questions. First, to gauge their attribution ratings, did Jimmy feel guilty about breaking the music box? And secondly, to gauge their affective ratings, what kind of emotion do you consider guilt to be? For our hypothesis to be confirmed, we would expect people to be more likely to attribute the subjective experience of feeling guilt to the SNM robot when they received a vignette in which the function was relevant to the emotional processing, in contra SNM, regardless of the valence associated with guilt in the experiment. And that is exactly what we found. When the SNM robot's function involved being a friend for the elderly instead of being a tool for lifting, People were much more likely to see that the robot had the experience of feeling guilty when it broke the music box, independently of the complexity of the robot, and again, independently of the valence people associated with guilt as measured by their affective scores. These results suggest that even subjective experiences involving felt emotions, just like olfactory states, can be attributed to a simple robot just so long as the specific emotional state or olfactory state is functionally useful to the robot in question. And of course, these results further question the valence hypothesis since these effects were detected without an effect for affect. Our study suggests that people's attributions of mental states to robots has more to do with their conception of the robots than with what they think of the mental states. After all, conscious states were, by Sitzman and Mascheri's lights, and by philosophical tradition, supposedly unavailable to simple robots. But in these studies, when participants understand that experiencing the state might contribute to a function the robot was designed to perform, they attribute that state to the robot. This fact leaves us with a question and several conclusions. First, the question. Why is it that when participants understand that experiencing the state might contribute to a function a robot was designed to perform, they go on to attribute that state to the robot. In other words, what's going on in people's heads? On the one hand, it's possible that people attribute experiential states to the robot only when, and in virtue of, the fact that they think the state would play a certain functional role in whatever task they think the robot was designed to perform. For example, a robot designed to be a friend to the elderly feels emotions like guilt because feeling those emotions plays a functional role in being a friend. This explanation, if correct, would support a broadly teleofunctional approach to experiential states. For, according to teleofunctionalism, for a system to occupy a certain mental state is for it to occupy a state that has a certain role within the system. On the other hand, it may be that people are making certain assumptions about the robot's design, such that if they understand that the robot is designed to perform a certain function, they will suppose that the robot was given machinery sufficient to give rise to whatever states are needed to perform that function. For example, because feeling emotions like guilt plays a role in being a friend, a robot designed to be a friend to the elderly will have been designed with the machinery necessary to affect guilt experiences.
Future research will have to decide between these two potential explanations. Regardless of which of the explanations is correct, our results suggest that Sitzma and Mashiri's valence view of the folk concept of subjective experience is incorrect, since valence was not correlated with participants' attributions of conscious states. Furthermore, whichever explanation is correct, our results suggest that Sitzma and Mashiri's case against the philosophical tradition of sorting mental states into experiential and intentional states may be unfounded. For, regardless of the specific explanation, these results suggest that the asymmetry and attributions found by Sitzma and Mashiri between folk participants and philosophers may be due to diverging assumptions about the function for which the robot was created. In Sitzma and Mashiri's original vignettes, function is left unspecified. Given that philosophers are used to assessing thought experiments and attributing to the situation only what is specified in the prompt, it seems reasonable to suppose that they may think the robot was designed with no particular function in mind. Thus, they have no reason to attribute the specific states under consideration. Ordinary participants, however, are not trained in the philosophical practice of assessing thought experiments. Thus, they may, reasonably enough, suppose that the robot was designed with a specific function in mind. While seeing colors or smelling an obscure chemical seem as though they could play a role in helping a robot perform whatever functions a robot was designed to perform, it's tough to imagine how feeling anger or pain could play any role in reasonable robot functions. Further experimental research on the topic of consciousness attribution is needed. We think it would be particularly useful to investigate whether verbal descriptions of mental states to robots are transparent, or whether, in fact, they are merely shorthand to suggest, for example, a complicated pattern of information in a robot's mainframe. But we want to conclude by suggesting two upshots of our work presented in this paper. Recently, philosophers such as Jesse Prince and Josh Nob, and psychologists such as Dan Wagner and Paul Bloom have suggested that ordinary people recognize a critical discontinuity between phenomenal and intentional states, such that they refrain from attributing feelings and experiences to entities that do not have the right kind of body, though they may attribute thoughts to entities that lack a biological body, like corporations, robots, and disembodied souls. These results join a recent backlash against this view in suggesting that people will attribute phenomenal states to robots. Finally, while we believe that our results undermine Sitzma and Mashiri's attack on the manifest dichotomy view, it behooves us to point out that they are not clearly explicable according to that view either. The results suggest that people are perfectly willing to attribute subjective experiences like guilt to a simple robot. This may suggest that a philosophical reevaluation of the manifest dichotomy view is in order, or it may suggest instead that philosophers, experimental and otherwise, should abandon the assumption that people will not attribute phenomenal states to a simple robot. Either way, the S&M robot may be more like you than you'd care to admit. Hey.